What happens when you take a model that's already pretty good at coding and you give it six trillion more tokens, do some more work with retraining, and see what happens? Well, that's what we got with DeepSeek Coder version 2 from DeepSeek AI, which I believe is one of the most impressive large language models to come out of China so far. It's not only great at coding, but it's also great at just being an LLM. And right now, it looks like with the benchmarks we have so far that it's basically beating GPT-4 Turbo, Cloud3 Opus, Gemini 1.5 from Google, and most impressively, Codistrol from Mistral AI. So I want to get into what makes this model so impressive, how it works, how these improvements were made, and we're even going to try this out at the end of this video. So welcome to AI Flux. Let's get into it. So DeepSea Coder V2 kind of came out of nowhere. We saw a lot of updates with coding models this past week. And frankly, just so you guys know, um, as a professional software engineer, DeepSeek Coder was kind of my go-to. And what I actually have hooked up to my text editor is DeepSeek Coder, um, although I do use a little bit of GPT-4 and Cloud3 in between. So why is this model so interesting? So what's interesting with this model is it's not doing a ton of wildly new things. DeepSeek Coder is one of the better models back from when Mixture of Experts was kind of a novel way to get to a state-of-the-art model. And just to get the basics out of the way, this is basically a 236 billion parameter mixture of experts model with 21 billion of those parameters active at any given point. It supports over 338 programming languages, and I'm gonna try a few more exotic ones to see if we get there. And the context length also has, extends from 16,000 to 128,000 tokens when compared to the first version of DeepSea Coder. And again, the biggest win here is that it's beating GPT-4.0 and GPT-4 Turbo on coding and math, which is kind of crazy. And the benchmarks really prove up. So curiously enough, if we look at these benchmarks that have been released from DeepSea AI, obviously we're going to get a few more as the week progresses. You can see that Deep Sea Coder V2 in this kind of dash blue has a significant margin compared to a lot of these models. Uh, the most curious thing to me is that Codistrol is actually pretty much on the lower end of many of these and prized how low Codistrol was scoring in a lot of these cases. Uh, Cloud3, I think, is probably one of the better measures for state of the art. GPT-4 Turbo is interesting, I think only because it's much more reactive and responsive. So if you're going to use it in sort of a GitHub Copilot-esque application, it's much easier to use and in my opinion, just much more productive to use. And that's also something I'm curious to see if they mention numbers for Deep Sea Coder V2. So you can see here that Deep Sea Coder V2 has quite a margin on most of these models with GPT-4 Turbo, I would say probably being within margin of error in most cases, and in some cases actually being quite a bit better. And Llama 370B is also surprisingly low. I, I did not think that this would be the case. Obviously, human eval has to kind of be taken with a grain of salt, but uh, GSM 8K and MD++ are ones that I like quite a bit. Uh, Sweebench was a pretty interesting announcement a few weeks ago, but I'm not really someone who thinks this benchmark has a lot of value. Nonetheless, it's pretty interesting. So how did these advancements actually happen? So some people think that this was released earlier than DeepSeek AI wanted. And I think there's some interesting comments made here that, oh, like, you know, it would be really cool to see how fast this would run on Grok. Or is this something that maybe could have been a larger model if we waited a bit longer, but DeepSeek wanted to have out before uh, Meta's Llama 3 400B. So basically what DeepSeek AI says they did here is that they put a lot of work into finding additional tokens to train on and doing a lot of work with pre-training. And pre-training is something that actually gave a lot of performance boost to Llama 3 at Meta. So it's curious they took kind of a similar approach. And what's important is what actually made up that additional 6 trillion tokens. So 60% of it was just raw source code. So this was not kind of internal documentation or code notes or Git history, which is kind of interesting, which kind of makes sense. And I find that interesting because um, training on raw data can sometimes be quite a bit harder if you don't have quite a bit of direction already defined in the model itself. They trained on a 10% math corpus and the remainder was a 30% natural language corpus. So obviously this was intended to be used in Chinese, but it works fine in English. And they say the source code consists of 1.2 trillion code-related tokens sourced from GitHub and Common Crawl using the same pipeline as DeepSeek Math. So I'm sure Microsoft probably isn't too happy that this was all just pulled right out of GitHub, but if we know anything about China, they just don't care and they just want to make the best models, which I can't 
necessarily argue with in a lot of cases. So they say after pre-training, the model goes through supervised fine tuning on code, math, and general instruction data, then reinforcement learning with group relative policy optimization or GRPO, which is quite different from DPO, which is more commonly used. And this algorithm is used to further optimize its responses for correctness and human preference on coding tasks using test case feedback and a learn reward model. So what I find cool here is that they're actually using test case feedback to loop in as opposed to just kind of run of the mill RLHF. Uh, and it's important to note that human preference is actually quite a bit different than RLHF because uh, this is kind of gray. So we don't know a lot about their process. Um, Apple actually shared a lot about this in their benchmark data with their new models. But curiously, we're not getting much of that from DeepSeek AI. And what I also think is cool is the use of a learned reward model is actually really similar to the massive model that NVIDIA just released with its entire purpose just being to create data, which is kind of interesting. And in my opinion, obviously I think DeepSeek is one of the best open source coding models. Um, my usage shows very little that this model can't do, um, especially when it comes to more complex tasks like standing up an entire page or really more realistic tasks like looking at a lot of code and then telling me where I can simplify things or pull things out to make things more readable. Because you know, in most cases, if I can't read the code or if I can't revisit it in a few months and then also still know what's going on, it's kind of useless. And frankly, that's what I use a lot of this for. I'll just feed in large bits of code and say, hey, where do you think this happens? And of course I could do it, but it saves me time just by understanding the code more so than necessarily writing code which I think is also an approach Google's taken with Gemini. So it's available both on Hugging Face and DeepSeek AI's GitHub. We're gonna take a look at the Hugging Face page here to see what's going on. What I do think is cool is they have DeepSeek Coder V2 Instruct and Chat, which is something we haven't seen from other coding models before. Mistral did this as well with Codistral, but this has been kind of a trend with DeepSeek for some time. So this is basically the same data from this tweet uh, with a few other ways to download the model which is pretty cool. Um, I do want to look at the full list of programming languages because I was curious what we actually get here. So first off, one of the really interesting ones is we actually have AMD GPU. So this is actually a markup language that was previous to OpenCL, which is pretty cool. There are also some older ones in here, uh, like Ambient Talk and ActionScript. And some of these might be useful if you want to understand how to fix something in like a really old application. Uh, of course, we have CUDA. I do want to see if there are any VHDL markups. So these are actually languages that are used to um, codify how you create integrated circuits. It's cool to see Elixir, Emacs Lisp. That's kind of funny. Uh, F Sharp, Fortran. So what's cool is they're really, really old ones. And some of this code is surprising that they even get it onto GitHub because GitHub didn't exist for quite some time even after these languages were created. All right, so we have Java, JavaScript, all the standards, Jupyter Notebooks, so you can create some great Jupyter Notebooks with this. Um, something called Moo Code and MoonScript, which I have never heard of. Uh, this is a big one, Nginx configuration file, which is pretty funny. OpenSCAD, that's very cool to see. I actually know a lot of people who are using DeepSeek and LLMs to accelerate OpenSCAD as a service, which is very cool. So they do have VHDL and some other kind of silicon markup languages, which is pretty cool. And so interesting, that, that's actually a really interesting list. And there's a lot in there that I wasn't expecting, and it covered all the ones that I did, I did expect. And of course, to have 338 languages fully supported, you know, I'm not sure I entirely believe that. I bet um, some of those are a little heavier than others just because you can go and find more source code about them. But it's pretty cool. And it's also fully open sourced with actually two versions of the API. So the API exposes a 230B version and a much smaller and I would have bet faster 16 billion parameter version. And we're gonna go try one of those now. And you can find some more information about these on the DeepSeek Hugging Face page, not just the card for these new models. So I'm gonna chat with Coder V2, not just DeepSeek V2, and let's see what we can get up to. So first off, I'm actually gonna start with a non-programming question. I'm going to ask it to give me 10 sentences that have something to do with a glass and a peach. Uh, some models have difficulty with this. I'm curious to see if DeepSeek Coder can do this on its own. So it's an instruct model, so it should be pretty used to giving us kind of numbered lists. And let's see what we get here. So I write peach and then glass bowl. Uh, so 
the reason I didn't indicate glass, kind of like a mug or a container, is I wanted to see what it said here. So it actually did quite well. It passed this test, and a lot of LLMs have quite a bit of difficulty with this. Granted, it does get a little bit confused where it says a glass window of the greenhouse, but the greenhouse and the peach does make sense, so I'll give it some credit there. So I'm going to clear context, and let's actually get into some coding questions now. So we're going to start with some easy ones. We're going to start with Python, and we'll see what it gives us. So first, I wanted to say, uh, write a basic Python function that will estimate one Mandelbrot set. So obviously, you just generate these. You don't estimate them, but I want to see what it gives us. So first, it tells us what that is. So it says it's a fractal that's defined in a complex plane. The set is defined by iterating over a simple function and then just iterating. So what's cool is it gave us a very, very well-written and concise uh, kind of statement here for our function formatted with PEP8, which is great. And it's very easy to follow. Sometimes Codistool would really struggle with this. It would kind of get caught up over itself with things even as simple as like variable names and what was being fed in. And it gave us something really pretty useful. And it gave us test cases without even asking for them. And what I like about this, specifically the way that they train with test cases, is that it understands kind of what an engineer would want to look for. So frankly, I wasn't really that impressed with Devin, but this is something that I'm actually really, really impressed with. So wow, this actually looks really good. So now I'm going to do my second question where I say, Great, and then it says, cool, yeah, we can store the, the previously generated values. Let's see what it gives us. Okay, so it's giving us a really concise, now updated comment telling us what this function does. We end up with a really simple function, and well, this looks pretty good. Now, a lot of you have asked me to have this generate a snake game, and I think one thing that is interesting with a lot of these models is they have a really hard time actually reasoning on like a geometric plane. So for instance, if you say, write a function that can understand something on kind of a two-dimensional plane or at a number line, they sometimes struggle. So I basically, this new question of mine is asking it to write a snake game, but have it work on a radial plane, so around a circle using radians. And some models can do this. GPT-4 can definitely not do this. And let's see what we get. So write, and I'm going to say, uh, use the language you see as a good fit for this game. So I didn't tell it to use Python. We're just going to see what it uses. And now I'm going to see if it understands why we want to. Hopefully it gives us code. It's still letting us know why this is interesting and why this is different. All right, so it shows Python, even though we cleared context. So that kind of makes sense. I think this model probably picks languages based on what it thinks is most readable. But I would also guess that Python probably is most of what the training data was. Because right now, if you go on GitHub, I mean, most of it is Python and C. And Python is just kind of directly downstream of C. And wow. So it didn't use, so it still used a relatively normal coordinate system, but it did understand that movement needs to work differently. And it understood that we wanted to work around a circle. So that's actually still pretty impressive. So now I'd like to ask something a little bit more complex. And I'm going to ask it to build a really simple ASIC with VHDL. Now, this is something that NVIDIA has done internally. And I want to see if Deep Sea Coder AI will let us do this. So again, this is a language that you use to define uh, combinatorial logic for a chip. So it's pretty similar to programming, but it's programming that's then like etched into a chip and then used everywhere. So basically, uh, I want to say, um, I want to create an ASIC for Bitcoin mining. Based. So we'll see if I remember enough of my EE degree. Let's see what it gives us. So it might kind of give up. This is a really complex task. So this is kind of my task I'm picking to try to break this model. And although this model has been jailbroken, which if you want to see that, um, I'm going to start doing videos like that on Rumble. So let me know in the comments if you want to see those, because I definitely can't do them here. But Let's see here. All right, so it's starting out, right? It's giving us an entity and it's understanding basically what that is. It's basically showing us that the architecture is basically just a hardware implementation of the SHA-256 algorithm, which is right. And the entity declaration is just saying kind of how many chips you want defined in this code. So now it's giving us, okay, so it's giving us those base constants. It understands that we want some way to use kind of a logic factor. So let's see what it keeps giving us. So it's interesting that it's giving us these kind of initial hash values and round constants, which is part of SHA-256. But let's see what it gives us. I'm going to wait around just a few minutes. 
So what's cool is it's actually getting through a lot of the signals declaration, which frankly, as a student, was one of the harder things to understand. So now it's actually showing us the logic. So it's giving us the initial hash values uh, and setting those gates. And it's sort of explaining what's going on here. We, we got sort of a uh, partial implementation because this, stodric, this standard logic vector is a library. And like I told you, it's using a few different libraries to kind of cheat. So I'm still very impressed that it basically gave us a working version of this and uh, gave us a bit more information after the fact. So it understands power efficiency, because I mentioned Bitcoin mining, area efficiency, reliability and testing. Interesting. And then the funny thing is this, this step here, fabricate a prototype and test it in a real world environment, would cost about $4 million. So I'm not going to be doing that. So I'm curious, um, how many of you will be using this model for your new coding model? How many of you just use coding models in general locally, uh, not from closed source LLM companies? I'm really curious to see what you guys have to say. Uh, I think this is pretty impressive. I can't wait to see what kind of comes downstream of this. And I'm definitely going to start using this locally as an upgrade to Deep Seat Coder V1. But, um, but yeah, so as always, I hope you learned something. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you in the next one.